Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome back to the Reliability Matters podcast. I'm so glad you're with me today. Today, we're going to talk about contract manufacturing. Do you have a circuit assembly that needs to be built? Don't have enough equipment in-house or enough uh, bandwidth or specialized expertise to build it? You may be best served by utilizing the services of a contract manufacturer. Contract manufacturers come in all shapes, sizes, and capabilities. Should I seek out a Tier 1 manufacturer? How about Tier 2 or 3 or 4? And what does Tier stand for anyway? Should I have my assemblies built overseas or in-country? What about issues such as ITAR? Who will be providing the components? What if I need more than just boards assembled? What if I need design, testing, or box build? To answer these and many more questions, I've invited my friend and colleague, David Raby, to be my guest. David is the president of STI Electronics, founded in 1982 by David's father, the late Jim Raby. For those who have been around the industry for some time, you'll know Jim Raby for his work with the U.S. Navy in establishing military standards for electronics manufacturing and the development of the NASA and Department of Defense soldering schools. Over the past 40 years, STI Electronics has expanded its focus from consulting and technical seminars to providing training, laboratory analysis, advanced research and development, microelectronics assembly, prototyping, and small to medium volume PCB contract manufacturing for the electronics industry. David graduated from Auburn University with a bachelor's degree in aviation management. So let's begin our conversation with Dave Raby. Hey Dave, welcome back. Hey Mike, thanks for having me. Well, it's, a, it's, it's always a pleasure to invite a guest and particularly uh, one that's done it before and is still willing to come back. So, you know, I appreciate you having me. Back. You've been warned and you have the experience. Uh, so uh, for those who may not be aware, uh, there's a little spinoff of this podcast uh, called Concept of Creation, where we get into, uh, we talk to entrepreneurs and, and business owners, uh, CEO type people uh, who were crazy enough to get in, you know, to leave the security of a nine to five job with a, you know, with a paycheck that comes every week. Um, and, and to go off on their own. And you did something even scarier. You joined the family business, which, which uh, I, I've, I've been involved in a family business, and it could be quite challenging in so many different ways because the stakes are so much higher. Um, but for those uh, who are interested in the journey side, uh, uh, David and his family's journey into entrepreneurship, um, I'll put a link to that episode in the show notes. So if you're listening to this, podcast on your favorite podcast app, uh, just check out the show notes. There'll be a link to that episode. Um, it's much less technical in nature. It's a little bit more a journey, the story of a journey, uh, entrepreneur journey, and the challenges and joys and risks and all that crazy stuff that goes on in building a business, particularly within a family dynamic. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, just click, you know, somewhere down here, there's a button that says show more, click the show more button, and uh, you'll see a link to that show. Um, so today, uh, David and I are going to talk about contract manufacturing, um, you know, which is basically exporting all your trouble and giving it to somebody else uh, to work out. Um, I want to, you know, we want to talk about the contract manufacturing uh, industry in general. And as I said in our intro, contract manufacturers come in all shapes, sizes, capabilities, things like that. Let's start with this tier structure. Uh, I, we've all heard of or people at least in the EMS industry heard of the term tier one, tier two, tier three, et cetera. Um, walk me through the tier structures. Uh, what is a tier one and how does that differ from maybe a tier four? Okay, well, what, great way to start on the first question is I really don't know the definition of it, but a, a tier one, that's the big guys. Those are the ones that are building cars or they're working directly for their OEM, which is the original equipment manufacturer um like i said they they are the big guys in the in the talking in the billions of dollars so you know um, enough you may not know the specifics but you know you're not a tier one then i i, I know we're, right. we're gonna get you know tier two 
they supply to tier one generally. Um, a lot of times they're building subsets of something or something like that for tier one. Um, tier three, which is like a hundred million dollars to a half billion dollars a year, they're building for tier two or tier one. Tier four is less than a hundred million. That's generally as far as the tiers go is less than a hundred million. We're probably like a tier eight if you're going on this scale, but I don't think dictionary wise there's a definition for that. Yeah, I, I did a little research, and I'm, I'm not sure how accurate this is. You know, if I can go on the philosophy, if Google says that it must be true, then this is obviously true. But tier one, you know, somewhere greater than five billion dollars in revenue, um, and tier two, um, uh, five hundred million to five billion, somewhere in, you know, in between there. And then three is, as you mentioned, about a hundred million to half a billion, and then tier four, uh, less than a hundred million. I would assume that the majority of contract manufacturers probably fall into the four category. And then there's a handful of, of tier ones. Tier ones would be the Jables and Selectrons and, and right. th those types I, of I would companies. imagine that's a pretty good pyramid. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's, it numbers, you know, way bigger than I could totally fathom anyway. Um, if I'm a, an OEM or if I'm in a, the, the, if I have the need to produce a hundred boards, I have a small project, maybe it's prototype, maybe it's just a small small run or, or legacy board, you know, that I have to repair for the army or something. Um, I could go technically speaking, like I guess I could go to a tier one and if they're crazy enough to take it, they're probably not going to touch it. They're probably going to send it down the ladder. Um, but, um, should a, based on your experience, should a company with a small volume need just go directly to tier four or smaller, or is there an advantage in, dealing with the quote unquote, you know, the, the, the big gorilla in the room or, you know, what, what, what would your advice be to how to, where to start looking at least eliminate through the process of elimination, eliminate the people that would just make no sense. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to answer this question the way that I'm probably going to answer a lot of questions today with it depends, but, um, you, you are correct. You probably don't want to go directly to a tier one, um, with the hundred boards. Um, for the most part, they're going to laugh at you if you do that. However, there are some of the places, and you mentioned Jable. I know they have a new product development lab that they can build smaller volumes, but I think they're mainly interested in those if they're going to turn into something to a much larger volume. Um, and you can walk your way down the other tiers, and I think you're going to get that same answer. So I think your best bet is going to be going to a, to the tier four, simply because you know a hundred a hundred boards that's a decent order for us, um, you know, and it is something that we pay attention to and and we're happy to get. We're going to take our we're going to take our time and make sure you get the care that you deserve from it and that you want from it. Where you know you can imagine if you throw a hundred boards into a place that's building millions every day, um, you're probably not going to get that one-on-one -on -one attention that everybody feels like they deserve. Right. You call J-Bill and you say, I want to get the status of my 100 boards. They say, I'll call you back. And they call the tier three who calls the, the <laughs> four. And then maybe three days later, you get an answer back. Um, right. Yeah, deal with the source. I, I think that makes a yeah, lot and, of sense. And the answer may end up being you're right in line behind the iPhones. Right. <laughs> as, right. As soon as we finish building iPhones, we'll build your hundred. That's right. Yeah. And then we'll put them somewhere on a container ship and they can spend the next six right. months at sea uh, waiting to be unloaded. Um, so, you know, when I think of contract manufacturing, I think a very simple term. I think um, there's a, a, a printer and a reflow, a you know, pick and place machine and a reflow oven. And, and, you know, you print the board, reflow the, you know, mount the components um, and reflow the board and then ship it to the customer. Obviously there's a lot more, that goes on um, beyond just those three basic steps. Mm -hmm. um, we can use STI as, a, as an example, since that's what you're most familiar with. Um, what other types of services does STI offer beyond the, 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 the solder paste uh, pick and place and printing option? What, mm -hmm. what else generally goes on, not just at STI, but kind of in general with, 
with, the, with the, all the process steps to build a board? Okay. Well, your, your three major steps, that's correct. Um, you know, the, the idea is you're giving your product away to somebody that's going to send it back in a finished form, or at least in, in most cases, in the, at least the, the boards being finished and, and assembled. But um, as far as what else we can offer, uh, we can do engineering support. You know, or it is your board designed to where it's easy to manufacture. Um, we're not going to, STI is not going to re redesign your whole board from scratch, but we will help make it to where it's easier to manufacture and give suggestions on that. Um, we have an analytical lab, so we can go in and look at the, what the parts are made out of and see how everything goes together on that. Um, if there's any issues in the manufacturing, um, you know, we're going to do sufficient testing to make sure that before they come to you, they're all good. Um, we can do, that can be in the, it's always going to be visually inspected, but um, there's also electrical testing we can do if you require it. Um, we have a clean room. If you've got a product, you know, we're working on medical products that have, have to meet certain cleanliness requirements that they're built in a clean room. And we have that capability. Um, you know, do you want us to be able to repair and refurbish parts that you've already shipped to customers? You know, that's something, you know, something under warranty that breaks down the road. Um, what are you going to do with it? Is that something you want us to handle? We do, we do that for people all the time. Um, primarily, we're just build, assembling the circuit boards. Uh, putting the parts on those, but some places want us to do a box build where we're actually building the board and then put, putting screws in boxes and, you know, putting it in its final form. Um, sometimes we will warehouse things where you'll order a thousand of something, but you only want 500 shipped right now and you want us to hang on to the others till you need them. Um, we do that sometimes, and we have some customers that we will ship directly to their customer. That we've worked up a um, a trust with them that they know what we send out is going to be good, and they'll just send us, you know, here here's the the shipping label to the customer we want it to go to, and and we can do that. And most most places we don't do that. Most places, most of the time, if we're building for you, we're going to ship them back to you and let you do what you do with them after that. Sure, that makes sense. So if, if I needed a 1,000 boards over a year or so, but I only needed 100 every month or so, um, would most contract manufacturers use this economy of scale and build all 1,000 at the same time? Or does it make some sense to pace out the, the manufacturing or the assembly in case something changes? What, what would your take generally be on that? You mean things can change? <laughs> um, well, uh, things are in this business. Uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're like a, you know, they're like they're like one of those metronomes. You know, you know that tick 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 tick. I think that's the speed of which our industry changes. No, um, no, you're you're exactly right. And back to my first answer is it depends. Right. Um, you know, from my point of view, well, from your point of view, is the product going to change over the next twelve months? Because um, you don't want me to build 12 months worth and then a month from now be pulling 11 months off the shelf and reworking them because that, that gets expensive for both of us. Um, from my point of view, if we have all the parts and you're, you're confident it's not going to change, I had much rather build them all at one time because it is a lot more efficient. Um, it's cheaper, the, it's easier to, to make sure we've got the quality right and everything if we can build them all at once. Um, you know, I mean, one thing I am going to insist on in that case, especially if I've had to buy the parts, um, then I want to be paid for what I'm building. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to do the work and, and wait a year to get paid while, while we ship that monthly. So I... Um had an experience and I've shared this story on, on this podcast uh, a couple of times. So sorry to my regular audience for the redundancy. Um, I was hired as a expert witness to represent a contract manufacturer in a civil case where an OEM 
contracted with the CM, wrote up a very poor statement of work. And to give you an example, they wanted the contract manufacturer to purchase, circuit, to purchase boards, to acquire the, the board and handle the fabrication. And under the board material, and I, and I quote, FR, down and dirty FR4, nothing special. That was on the statement of work, right? So if I was a contract manufacturer, I would look at, I, I would just presume from that one description that they really don't care much about quality. This is probably a product that has a short life expectancy, maybe planned obsolescence, maybe an electronic flea collar or something like that, which it wasn't, by the way. But, um, that just, to me, is a crystal ball kind of, you know, uh, the tea leaves say they don't care a whole lot, so neither do, right. so neither do I. Um, but then they also required this product to be uh, tested uh, and uh, baked out for a specific period of time and then potted in a silicone um, encapsulant material. And over the time that they were building boards, uh, the they needed more boards than the... CM can produce in, in the given time. They're, they were funded by venture capitalists and the VCs were you know, wanting basically you know, weekly shipping reports and, and they were pounding their fists on the table to, to get more product delivered. So the OEM basically said, cut the testing in half. And at some point when some of the ovens broke, they said, don't bake. And the CM thought that we'll send out a letter saying this is not best practice, but if you want us to do it, just acknowledge and they acknowledged, and uh, products began to fail. Uh, there was a multi-million dollar lawsuit. 50,000 products had to be recalled. Uh, and, of course, they blamed the CM because they said the CM should have said no, um, which is practically true, right? Um, but legally, you know, may, maybe not. Maybe, maybe it's a little CYA letter, and, 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 right. but it still got them sued, and they still spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on attorney's fees, maybe more. So my question to you as a CM is, um, what level of responsibility does a CM have to take when the customer is asking for something that is not best in class or worse, you, based on your experience and your knowledge, you know will fail? How, how do you have those tough conversations with the client or potential client and ultimately have you ever been put in a position where you just had to say, I'm sorry, this is just not for us? Um, yes. Um, we have, if you come to us with a um, product you want built, we're going to go through with you, what requirements do you want this built to? Um, the, the simple version is, there's three levels of uh, IPC, which is the industry standards, um, level one, level two, and level three. Um, the level three are the high reliability type items. Level one, I always think of as your kid's toy. You, you mentioned the, the, the dog collar or something like that. Um, we're gonna ask a lot of questions to make sure we're building, we're building what you want. And you can tell when somebody doesn't know what they want or do, is not familiar with those, um, in a lot of cases anyway, you can tell, um, which throws up some red flags on our end to ask a lot more questions. Um, you know, I, the, like the supplier you just talked about, we, we would probably be sending out, you know, some make sure it was in writing that we suggested this, but you said, no, don't do this. Um, if we're supposed to be doing, um, if we're supposed to be baking boards, if that's in our, if that's something we bid on or quoted on, and all of a sudden you tell us to cut that out, we want it in writing from you that we cut that out. And we may or may not say, you know, we're, we're having this problem now that we've cut this out. Um, so yeah, it's a sensitive thing because you know you're always trying to look for a way to to cut the cost down, um, and in a lot of cases you're the one doing the testing. So from our point of view, if you're happy with it and it's working like you want it to, 
we think we're doing the job you want us to. Um, you know, they're like, you know, if we get somebody that says build this down and dirty, um, that is going to throw up a lot of red flags. And we, like right. I said, we're going to ask a lot more questions. But, I think there's uh, going to be two common answers to pretty much every question I ask you. One of them is going to be, it depends. Okay. And the other is, it's all, you know, communication, communicate, oh, yeah. communicate, communicate. So you're, exactly. you're, you're a, um, aviation, you have an aviation background, at least uh -huh. by, by, by training. Um, I'm, I used to fly planes and, and I haven't flown in a number of years, but you know, the three rules in the cockpit, you know, uh, aviate, navigate, communicate. Right? right. And, and I think in this Never. business, I think in this business, communicate, communicate, yes. communicate, right. The three most important rules. Um, what are some of the, since we're on the subject of mistakes, um, I think it was a mistake for that CM to accept the client. Clearly, in retrospect, in hindsight, uh, the word no would have been much more profitable than the word yes, because um, mm -hmm. the amount of money they paid the attorneys and the expert witnesses like me and others and, and deposition transcripts and just time that they'll never get back in their, their business life, um, none of that was big enough to, to uh, have a net gain. They, they clearly lost money on the whole deal. Um, and all that went to do is train the OEM to... Um, not, you know, to write statement of works a little bit differently. But what, what are the common mistakes that um, potential customers make when they shop around for a CM? Uh, I'm going to throw one out possibly is, is it all about price? Is it all about cost per whatever? Or are there other uh, maybe um, less obvious mistakes that, that people make when they are shopping for a, a contract manufacturer? Okay, well, what we see, uh, well, n number one is price. Um, you know, we will, um, a lot of the supplier or a lot of the customers start out with, we're really worried about quality, price is not that important. But then when it comes time to award the, the contract, you know, you were three cents higher than the other place that, um, and we know that other place can't spell quality. And, um, yeah, so that, um, that's a common thing, you know, it, you know we're, we're all about quality if price is not important. It not always ends up that price is important. Um, we used to try to be real competitive on that and we still have to be relatively competitive, but we're not going to get a job just based on price. Um, that's something we had to decide quite a while ago. Um, customers also, they're real, they're, um, they've got to be realistic on their expectations and their requirements. Um, you know, if I, I talked about the IP, different levels of IPC um, requirements, um, you know, you may be coming in asking for something to be built to level three when it's really a level one or a level two product. And if somebody else is quoting it as a level one or a level two, they're going to beat our price. Um, you know, you may not be getting what you want if it really is supposed to be a level three, but, um, but that is, um, you know, we're going to quote it like what you told us to. You know, that, um, that's interesting you say that because the whole class system, class one, two, three, level one, two, three, however one phrases it, um, you know, class three would be aerospace, medical. Um, class one would be electric toothbrushes and remote controls, things like that. Class two, office equipment. Um, what's interesting is Internet of Things, IoT, uh, is electrifying everything now. Everything is a connected device. So... Yep. You know, I use the example of an electric toothbrush. There, there is now an electric toothbrush made that connects to your Wi-Fi that has an accelerometer and other sensors in it. So it could narc on little Jamie or Johnny or Jane and let the parents know how long they brush their teeth, um, maybe how vigorous they move the toothbrush, whatever the case may be. Now, clearly, that is a class one device. Right, because a failed electric toothbrush is not going to kill anybody. Right. Um, I was thinking you were saying it was going to shock little Jamie. Or... Well, that, that's, that's a whole other can of worms there, but we'll, we'll keep that can closed for a moment. But it clearly, from a, um, 
the cost of failure standpoint, you know, it's relatively mm -hmm. low. However, <clears throat> manufacturers of toothbrushes, even if they sell a little $40 connected toothbrush, it still has to work, right? Because they, they don't want a bunch of warranty claims. That might have to be built closer to a class three standard mm -hmm. just so that it will function in a harsh environment for, mm -hmm. for a few years, even though it clearly is not, would not historically be defined and traditionally right. be defined as a class three device. I think those classes are, are morphing a little bit because I, I can have a cheap product and I don't make much money on it, but it still has to last a year or two or three. Um, so I, I think your point is, you know, back to your, it depends is if someone's shopping for the cheapest price and say, look, this is a class one device because nobody dies if it fails, they might get it built for a few cents cheaper, but, but, but it may not be reliable. Um, no one dies, but there, uh, except maybe the company's reputation, which could also be expensive. So it, it it is a very blurred line right now. I think the, the class system or the level system in terms of, of um, extra steps and higher grade materials and more testing, things like that, uh, or better conformal coating, or whether it's conformal coated at all, uh, really depends on in-use environment, not just the total cost of failure. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I, I grew up in a household that was NASA and then military. And neither one of those could you have a failure. I mean, it, it just wasn't an option. So everything had to be built to the absolute highest quality standard. And so I grew up in a house that believed that those would now be what's called level three. And level one was the disposable things. And then anything else would be either level one or level two. But now, you know, a self-driving car or something like that, it would be hard to argue that's not level three and just as critical as, as something else. Absolutely. Uh, the ADAS you know, systems, you know, the ADS right. systems on cars, um, mm -hmm. which w used to be electronics and cars used to be infotainment, seat mm -hmm. massagers, things that, you know, it's irritating if they fail, but nobody dies. Right. Now with, uh, with, um, adaptive cruise control and blind spot indicators and the semi-autonomous, you know, driving the LIDAR stuff. It, that stuff fails. People die. Right. So, um, yeah, that definition of what's a level one, level two, level three is a little bit fuzzy these days. But, um, you know, I mean, we, I've also always operated under the idea of a solder joint, joint doesn't know if it's being built to one, two, or three. Uh, so we do our best to build it right. Um, it's the inspection requirements that that can differentiate then. Yeah, there may, there's more inspection that goes on under level three or the the um, string, um, the tightness of those requirements are higher on level three. Sure. But the solder joint itself should be built the same way. Yeah, I remember back in the, as, as you well remember, because it was in your blood, everything used to be, not everything, but the majority of, of the inspections would be the solder joint. Um, mm -hmm. solder joint integrity, the right fillet yeah. on a through hole, whatever the case may be. Right. Um, there's so much more now that mm. has to be inspected from, you know, ionic contamination or, or, or uh, foreign object debris, uh, which can cause frequency distortion and electrochemical issues to um, voiding and mm -hmm. thermal dissipation and conformal coating adhesion. I mean, there's so many, I'm just scratching the surface. There are so many things now that have to be right as we've miniaturized the, the board right. and uh, those boards are more frequently going out into harsh environments, which is really pushing the, mm -hmm. the edge of the envelope. Uh, and, and the clock speeds, the frequencies on boards are just much higher now. The voltages on boards are, are particularly with electrification of cars, as you talked about, so much higher now that it's not just, right. not just a 16X loop and does right. the solder joint look good? We've come a long right. way from that. Right, and, and there's so many different ways now to look at a solder joint, too, with x-rays and other things. So, um, you know, that's still the first, you know, if, if the solder joint doesn't look right and look is, is pretty standardized according to 610, um, if it doesn't look right, it's not going to pass anything, usually. 
but um, if it does look right, in some cases, that's good enough. That's all that it takes. Right, and but when you say for, 610, you're, you're referring to the IPC standard um, uh, 610, uh, which correct. is a, a quality standard, basically. Right, and, and back in the old days, which may have been, what, five, 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> Could have been 10 minutes ago. Yeah, well, good point. Um, you know, we would visually inspect the solder joints, and that's how you determined if a board went out or not. And um, now, first off, things have gotten small, which means you can't see all those solder joints. Uh, parts are designed differently, where there's solder joints underneath parts, um, so you can't see those without the aid of machines. And um, so the requirements for that um, inspection have gotten a lot more complicated. Yeah, I've, I've said this uh, too many times on the show, but I but it, it's true. I, well, it's not true technically, but I like to make the point. You know, you talked about X-ray as an inspection tool. I'm pretty convinced X-ray uh, caused voiding because before yeah. X-ray, no one saw a void, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's <is> true. <laughs> so um, damn X-ray. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If it didn't fall off, yeah, it, right. the edge, the card edge test where you take a circuit card and you slam it on the board on its edge, and if the components are still there, ship it. So we talked about <laughs> mistakes that potential customers can make when they're interviewing mm -hmm. uh, contract manufacturers. You know, I own a business, as you're aware, and I've learned a long time ago that we interview our customers just as much as our customers interview us. Now, that sounds like a very arrogant statement, and I don't mean it to sound that way, but we choose customers as much as customers okay. choose us because if it's not the right relationship – no one's going to be happy. We won't make money. They will be unhappy. Our reputation will be damaged. And we don't want to take money from someone who's not happy. We, mm -hmm. we want it to be a partnership. As Pollyannish right. as that sounds, it needs right. to be a partnership, even more in your industry. Um, so what maybe one mistakes do you think some contract manufacturers might make? Or to put it more positively, what types of questions should – a good contract manufacturer be asking of their potential customer. You know, if you're, you're shopping for a customer, what types of questions do you ask to help to ensure that it becomes a uh, mutually successful partnership? Um, I'm going to ask them, I've got going to have a lot of questions about the product. Um, how developed is it? Is it, you know, you're telling, I, well, first off, I'm going to ask about their requirements and their quantities and how realistic those are. Um, and, ha, you know, have you built the, have these been built before or is this a new product? Because if it's a new product, there's probably going to be changes to it, which that's fine. It just needs to be thought of from the beginning. Um, you know, how, how firm is your, Quantity. You were talking about somebody that was, um, you know, being asked to constantly increase their quantity. Um, you know, we can do that. I love increasing the quantity on something. Um, but is that, um, you know, we've got to know in a, ahead of time so we've bought the right parts and all of that type of thing. Um, obviously, I want to know your financial strength. Am I going to get paid for this? Um, you know, if, um, you know, pick a big company, you know, Boeing or Airbus comes in and they want a hundred thousand of something, that's great. But if, you know, um, you know, Dave's lawnmower shop comes in and wants a hundred thousand of it, we probably really need to be looking into that a little bit better. Right. Um, not that we wouldn't do it, but we might have to have some different requirements. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, we have, we really want to see the design and know how finalized that is. Um, we, we have made the mistake in the past of saying, you know, you, you saying, yeah, I think it's going to be this. And we're like, yeah, we can do that. And then it turns out there were some changes or there was material used or something that for whatever reason we couldn't do it or we we at least couldn't do it under the the um the cost constraints that we had bid on and um a lot of times we've had to eat that 
um, mm. because we didn't ask the right questions. So now before we give you a quote, it's going to go through our whole team. We, we used to try to, to get our quotes out really quick, but we have learned that we want to know as much as we can about this before we quote on something. Um, so our manufacturing people, our quality people, um, you know, everybody sees this and um, gets a chance to say, well, you know, this park up here in the corner might be a problem. And um, we want to come ask you about that. And um, we'll do that before we actually submit the quote, which we do get some people saying, well, you know, I really need this quote quickly. But in the long run, it pays off to ask all the questions because sometimes we'll come back and ask you a question about it that you hadn't thought of. And you need, um, you know, whether it's a testing requirement, an assembly requirement or whatever. And um, if, you, if we make you answer that question, it's better for you and it's better for us. And right. Yeah, while customers like to get their quotes quickly, that has made a nice impression on some customers <laughs> that they went from being mad because the quote was late to happy because, hey, we've already solved the problem for them, or, or at least we show we know enough to ask about this. Yeah, better to ask the question before you start building than during a failure analysis meeting <laughs> to mm -hmm. figure out what went wrong. <laughs> have you ever had a situation you talked about sometimes your, you suggest design changes? You know, we have a term that our industry embraces that I'm sure other industries do too. It's always a challenge and that's designed for manufacturability. Right. And sometimes a designer can design something, but you can't build it the way they designed it. Right. And, you know, maybe there's a very small part that has to be mounted or they put right next to a giant mm -hmm. copper ground plane or something. And there's solderability, you know, wicking issues or wetting issues because of the heat loss, whatever the case may be, that may be a bad example, but, but have you, had to go back to customers and say, look, that's a great idea, but if we just move this here and this here, mm -hmm. it doesn't affect operation, but it would make your life, which then downflows mm -hmm. to their life, a whole lot easier. Uh, have you had to do that, and are customers generally open to that? Let me answer with it depends. It depends. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, we commonly do that. It, what depends on is the customer going to do it or not. Right. Um, you know, sometimes moving this diode from you know this spot to another spot sounds so simple but they've already bought 50,000 boards yeah. that would be scrapped if we had to do that They're so invested. they'd rather they'd rather pay us to do it by hand you know that particular part than um, redesign their board um, rev b they'll fix it in rev b exactly right and um, you know how long rev b is away we, we never know um, we have, um, I set in on a meeting every Monday morning and I get the graphs with all of our quality numbers. And, um, you know, sometimes they come with an explanation of exactly what you just described. This part is in the shadow of this part and they all fail. Um, we've submitted for redesign and the customers promised us an answer within two months. Uh, but in the meantime, keep building. And, you know, it makes our quality numbers look really bad. But, you know, if I know there's an explanation like that, um, I, I can live with it. Well, you know, if but, they were building the product in-house, not using a contract manufacturer, that problem would be solved much faster. But because it's oh, yeah. not their problem, it's your mm -hmm. problem, um, mm -hmm. I think they, they don't quite have as much empathy as, right. as they could or desire and, and, or urgency. Yeah. Right. And we're very clear that we are not a design, we don't do original designs. Um, we maybe have one or two over the years, but that's not what, what we really do. But we do make a lot of suggestions to change um, for better manufacturing abilities. Mm -hmm. And um, exactly what you're talking about there. And, and generally it's received well, it's just whether it's actually ever changed or not because you know, I don't know how many steps a customer may have to go through to do that. If, it, if it's a small place where it's one guy that's designed it and trying to get it built, that's pretty easy. You know, he, normally he's pretty happy to do it. But you go back to a defense contractor that has gone through 
many levels of approval before they ever send it out to be built. Um, you know, it may take months or years for that design to change. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, some of the issues plaguing our industry. One of them, of course, the big gorilla in the corner, supply chain. How has the supply chain crisis uh, landed in your industry, specifically your company? And what can, if anything, uh, what are you doing, if anything, to um, at least partially mitigate as much as you can? Um, I, sometime last year or so, um, you know, as CEO, I went from being a, um, infectious disease specialist to a, um, supply chain specialist a world and a world political specialist. And I'm not sure I was actually ever trained for either one of those, but, um, I don't think the people who are in the highest levels of government are sp especially trained either. Um, <laughs> well, I, that, well, that's that, a whole nother show, but, but you know, I, but, you know, I, I'm, I, I can't do a whole lot about that. Right. Um, but, but no, I mean, it is, it's a, it's definitely a challenge. It's not just a challenge to me and my company. It's that this is an industry wide challenge that we just can't get the parts that we need to, to build in the quantities that our customers want us to build in. And it's not necessarily that their, their quantities have increased. It's just we can't get the parts to, to build anything in some cases. And, you know, the COVID caused, well, a lot of our parts come from Asia and specifically from China. And COVID caused various shutdowns of factories there and um, other issues that, just set things back. There's been um, resource um, shortages that have caused parts to not be built in the speed we'd like them to. Um, there's been all kinds of things that have um, disrupted the supply chain. Um, you know, for years, everybody wanted a just-in-time inventory. And those are the people probably that got hurt the worst. Um, right now, for the volume we're building, we're probably carrying in more inventory than we've ever had. Um, but there's problems with that too. Uh, you know, I mean, I may bid on a hundred thousand dollar job and fifty thousand dollars of that are parts. And you know, I go out and spend I, I get the order, I go out and buy my four buy fifty thousand dollars worth of parts or order fifty thousand and Forty-nine and a half thousand dollars worth of it come in, and there's one twenty-cent part that doesn't, and that means I can't build anything. Right. And now my customers are un unhappy because they're not getting the parts I've promised to build for them, and I'm unhappy because I've invested forty-nine and a half thousand dollars on stuff just sitting on the shelf that's not doing me any good. Yeah, um, uh, so. we are victims of supply chain, and we are also part of the problem um, mm -hmm. because. Just like, just like your company, my company went from just in time, which is Nirvana. When just in time right. works, it's great because the money stays in your bank until you absolutely need it. Um, mm -hmm. And we went from just in time to just in case. So mm -hmm. even though we put in probably a hundred X more effort, if mm -hmm. we typically buy a part on, you know, on demand <clears throat> and we have the opportunity to buy a year's worth, mm -hmm. we'll buy a year's worth now. Right. And, and, you know, we basically took whatever cash we had in the bank and just basically converted it to parts. Right. So there's, there's still an asset, right? But, uh -huh. and in our case, because we manufacture, you know, products that don't change very rapidly, we know if we don't sell it today, we'll sell it tomorrow. So we're not really right. concerned about it. Um, it doesn't go bad. It doesn't have a shelf life. But our walls are bursting at the seams with parts. And, uh -huh. um, you know, which drives me crazy, drives everyone crazy because we don't need all those parts right now. But it, but we owe it to our customers to have these parts in stock so we can service equipment we've already sold or, or build things that people need. So it's, um, you know, the only way to around supply chain is buy everything you can when you can. It's like going to Costco. If you see something you like at Costco, <laughs> buy it. Because if you say, oh, I'll go buy it next week, it's gone, right? So, yeah, you know, and, we, and you wonder, okay, if I buy six months worth, is that enough? Or do I, should I get a year? 
and it can right. if I get a year, should I get two years? <laughs> right. It used to be we would buy you know, I use a year as a placeholder, but if we would buy years with the parts if the price was right, then we'd like, okay. okay, well it's worth it. We'll we'll buy it. Now we'll buy years with the parts if we can even get them, right? It doesn't matter what well, the price is. Um I hope well, our, and, our vendors are listening to the show because it does matter what the price is. But right. uh, but you know yeah. what I mean. It's right. it's definitely challenging. Yeah, and as a contract manufacturer, um, we don't have the luxury of building the same thing over and over. Right, that's I mean, more way more complicated than your world. And, and in the we we have some customers that we build a few thousand parts each month for, and those we've had. We've had some blips, but mainly we've been good on because we always had orders in. We always had a couple of months supply, so if they were a month late, um, we still we had a cushion. Um, we like you were talking about. We have now started buying all we can of those parts, but we know we're going to use them. Um, so those have worked out well. What's what's been tough is we have a lot of customers. They may be regular customers but we build a variety of different part or different items for them. And a lot of them are, we're building for the first time. So they walk in with those and they're used to us delivering in six weeks. And now we're getting quoted that, you know, these parts are going to be here next March. And we don't have a lot of confidence that they are then. Right. Um, and, and so those are the ones that's hurting us on. How many of your customers, like from a percentage standpoint, supply their own parts like in a kit form to you versus say here's our bill of materials you 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 buy them um probably 25 percent supply the parts supply everything we do have what's become more common recently and i like this is we will buy the parts for the customer but they pay us as the parts come in yeah. You know, if, if, um, because in some cases they're telling us to buy a year's worth of parts. Um, and you know, or there's a part that's expensive and it's got a 30 week delivery on it and everything else on there has a two week delivery. So they're, we're going ahead and billing them for that, that one that we're having to order away in advance. Just to no, that makes sense. Our side. I think this is a community effort. It's a village approach. It takes a village yeah, approach. It, I think a lot of the yeah, OEMs are going like, to have to step up and carry right. some of that inventory, either pay you to carry it or carry it themselves. Um, you know, people with deeper pockets than you and I might have with the right. ability to buy a year's worth of stuff, if they can find it, um, right. are better off. And they probably would buy more parts than a small contract manufacturer would. So they might have a little bit more you know, clout. Right. They might have a, a shorter waiting uh, ticket, you know, mm -hmm. um, to get served than a small mm -hmm. uh, CM would have. Yeah, you're right. So let's talk about efficiency. I had another um, uh, production manager on my show a couple of years ago. It was a contract manufacturer, and his claim to fame was optimization. And I asked him point blank, can American... Can North American contract manufacturers compete with Asian contract manufacturers? Mm -hmm. And I was very happy with his response and surprised. He said, and his response was, absolutely. It's not about the labor. Everyone thinks you go overseas because the labor is cheaper, which is true. Mm -hmm. But if you have the money to put into optimization, into automation, you can take a lot of that labor out of the equation. And his, you know, the sword he falls on is any manufacturer can be competitive with any other manufacturer regardless of um, geological boundaries, um, it, it, or ge geographic boundaries. Uh, it's all about efficiency. And I, I kind of liken it to the aircraft industry, the airline industry, since you have that aviation mm -hmm. background. Uh, you'll appreciate this. You know, almost every airline leases their planes. Most airlines don't, like Southwest doesn't own a single plane. They're all leased. Um, so they make money when the wheels are up and they spend money when the wheels are down. That's why a lot of airlines, the low-cost airlines, specialize in 20-minute gate turns and you know, three extra flight segments a day and you know, things like that uh, so they can keep more wheel up time than wheel down time. 
And I would think that in, in your world, when your reflow oven has boards going through it, you're making money, assuming you quoted it right. Uh, when it's sitting idle, you're spending money because that machine has to be paid for. Uh, so how, does, uh, how do you specifically, how does STI Electronics optimize that? How do you make sure that your products, your equipment, which, has, which is very expensive, Right, I mean, the airline industry is one one level of expense. I, I think we're pretty close to it. You know, you spend a million dollars on a on a small surface mount line. Uh, you want it running. Uh, how do you go about um, creating that level of efficiency and optimization so that you have more time running than turnover, changeover time, maintenance time, things like that? That's a good question. Um, we're different than the person you were talking about that's trying to be so efficient. Um, you know, I can I can see their point on being competitive with Asian companies, but there's a, there's other things that go into that that I'm I'm not really sure that we can be. You're well, right. they're probably to be fair, they're probably a couple of tiers above most. Right. Um, Manufacturers, so they they probably have a bank account that can spend you know a few million dollars on automation that would be difficult for a mere mortal to spend, right? But um, but as far as STI goes, um, you know, I went through, I've been through industrial engineering classes and how to optimize things and all of that stuff. It's hard to apply to a place as small as us and with as many different jobs as we have. Um, we do have three lines now. Um, we, if you looked at our sales, it's not. It would probably be hard to justify three lines, but they've all. Each line has come about for a different reason, and it's been um, a lot of the changeover times. If we're running a particular product on our main line, um, it. We can't completely shut it down to switch over. The timing of that is bad. Um, so it was easier and cheaper, really, to have a second line. Um, you know, you, you mentioned uh, if something's not going through the reflow oven, that's exactly how I look at it. Um, I go back and try to walk around our manufacturing floor a few times a week. And the way our shop is laid out, one of the first pieces of equipment I walk by is the reflow oven. And the guys know the first thing I'm going to look at is, are there little yellow lines going down the conveyor belt? Because if they're not, you're right, we're not making anything. <laughs> and um, so I want to see that. But we're also small enough that there's not always going to be yellow lines going down through there. Um, we have equipment. Um, we, we've got a selective solder machine. Okay. That, that's a machine that we bought for one particular customer. And we had one particular job for that machine. And that job pretty much paid for that machine. But I don't have a need for it every day. So it'll sit there sometimes maybe for weeks or a month without being used. But, but it does give me a capability that somebody does need. So it's it's not being used to, with the efficiency I would like for it to, but it has paid for itself. Yeah, that's a whole. That's a good way to look at it too. Is is, you know, what do you need to make off off a machine versus? Right. I mean, I, I assume you use your reflow oven because that is you know a very key indicator, right? That, right. That's, that's a benchmark. If that's not moving, there's probably right. trouble. Uh, but mm -hmm. you're right. Other machines uh, that are used for more specialty things. Um, mm -hmm. And also, there's probably some machines you want to have just so that you can say yes to more. Customers, yeah, yeah, we exactly. can do that, right? Even if they decide not to do it, they might go with you because they might need to do it, right? So, well, yeah. Hopefully, we haven't bought any for that reason, but like the selective solder, we bought it for a you had a, you had a real job. application for and, it. And now I'm happy to tell you, hey, we've got selective solder if you need it. Right, right, and it'll happen again. I'll, I'll right. guarantee if you did if you sold the machine, you would have three jobs for it tomorrow. That's just the oh, way. Exactly. That's just the way it works. <laughs> exactly. Um, we got to wrap up. We're, we're just about out of time. This has gone like lightning fast. Um, where do you see um, the contract manufacturing world and STI electronics in general 
uh, in the future. You, you're, well, I, should, I should have said this earlier. Congratulations on 40 years. You guys started in 82. I just realized that's, yes. yeah, that's 40 years. So congratulations. Yes. That's a, Thank you. That's, uh, you know, I, th- I think business uh, is measured in dog years. So you guys are you know, a few hundred years old you know, by any other and, measure. And, and, well, and to quote the philosopher Jimmy Buffett, it's the good days and bad days and going to have mad days. Exactly. We've yes. Had a lot yes. Of those over 40 years. Absolutely. Um, but you would do it again in a heartbeat. I, I know you well enough to know you would do it again I, in a heartbeat. You know, I would simply because I like how, I mean, my life has been good and the people I've met in the industry and all of that, there's no way to replace it. Right. Um, if you told me financially how it was going to be 40 years ago, um, you know, I might have been doing something else. <laughs> I don't think any of us do this for them. I don't think entrepreneurs do it for yeah. the money. They do it for the passion. They do it, you know, like your father, uh, yeah. Jim, he definitely was a driven person. And yeah. I never got the idea or I never, he never came across to me anyway as business driven, meaning he wasn't the kind of person that was looking for every opportunity to make a buck. I know right. you and I both know people in our industry that, exploit every thing they can. And, and I'm not, and that's not a slam on them. That's no. just their nature, right? They, they find a way to make money out of everything. Um, your father, it seemed to me was quality driven. He was into how to build electronics correctly because he had that military connection and things had to be done right. And he was a standards guy and a training guy and all that. And that's what uh, from, a 30,000 foot press box view. That's how it appeared to me, uh, which is probably why you've been in business for 40 years. Um, because building a successful, no, let me rephrase that. Building a business that's going to make you billions of dollars is, is a, we're in the wrong industry for that. And, and B most people don't last long. They do make money and then they burn out and they sell it to, right. the, you know, to whoever, and then they crash it. Um, it seems like, you guys have a, a different mindset, um, which is why I can congratulate you for 40 years of business. But so much has changed in the last 40 years. This is what I was trying to get to. For, uh, so much has changed in your, in, in your business specifically, from a training company to you know, running soldering schools and, and training aids and things like that, to what you're doing now. That was 40 years. W- what do you think the next, it doesn't have to be 40 years, but how much more change do you think is in SCI Electronics future and in the contract manufacturing world, the EMS world in general. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the supply chain issues may change some people's view of the, uh, of the contract assembly or contract manufacturing industry, um, but I don't think contract manufacturing is going to go away. Um, as far as STI is concerned, um, you know, I don't want to say we're going to stay the same, but our primary, our primary market is the, the low volume, high reliability, um, or maybe um, medium volume, high reliability. And we primarily work military, aerospace, medical, high end industrial and safety critical. I mean, um, you know, we build, we build things that lives can depend on and we build those every day. And as a result, I think that's a good place for us to be. And I think we will continue to do that. So you know, as we talk five, 10 years from now, I think we will still be building that same family of products. Um, now I am sure those products are going to evolve. So the technology we use to build them will be different. The parts that we're putting on will be different. They may not look anything like what we're doing now. And we will evolve with that. Um, you know, we're, um, you mentioned training. We, we are still a training company. Um, we, and, um, which means we keep up with the latest things, but we also have the best trained solders and assembly people around because they're, they're right here in this building. Um, so, you know, if, if we redo this, you know, episode number 1001 instead of episode number 101, I think we will still be, um, 
doing a similar thing. It will just be with some different technologies. Um, I'm sure we will have added some things to it because we're always experimenting with how we can do something different. What market can we get into and all of that. But um, And like we talked about earlier, the definition of a high reliability part has changed. So where it used to just be military, there are so many other things which open up possibilities for us to get into. I mean, we're, we're doing more medical now than we used to. Um, and, um, but, um, you know, I can see there will be other categories that, that go along. I mean, I don't, you know, the, the um, electronics and cars and all of that, that's going to be increasing so much. But somebody our size is not going to be building car parts. Right. Um, that that's the different tiers. They're they're above us. But um, or if you are building uh, it, you're you're at the bottom of the food chain. Building it for someone. Right. Building it for someone. Building yeah. it for someone. Then then it goes to Bosch or Continental, right. and then it goes well, to GM or Audi or whoever. We we looked at building for a uh, uh, automobile uh, manufacturer um, several years ago, and this is the not saying yes to everything. Um, as we went through the contract, um, one of the, one of the small details in it was if we were delayed or if we were late on delivering something, the penalty was $10,000 a minute. And, um, wow. we decided then that, you know, this probably isn't for us. Yeah. i i I have friends who, or colleagues, I should say that, that are involved with the auto industry and they're not just the, the punitive penalties, those are amazingly high uh, because they live in a just in time world, right? Right. And which is the reason why Detroit has most of their vendors, you know, within 10 miles of them or whatever right. the case yeah. may be. But they also have a very bizarre um, payment schedule, too. They have holdbacks where, you know, they'll pay you a percentage, you know, a high percentage of, of what they owe within whatever time frame um, you agree on. Uh, but then they hold stuff back. And then, you know, you get that at the end of the year if you meet other benchmarks. I mean, it's. It's a, it's definitely a, um, I don't even think it's a carrot and stick. It just seems more stick than carrot. Right. But I guess the carrot is you get to build 20 million yeah. of something, right? That's the carrot. Right. But there's a huge and, stick applied to that. And, but it would be fun to know that, you know, on a Thursday in September, I'm going to build this. Yeah. You know, right, right now, we're pretty sure what we're going to build tomorrow Next week is starting to get into our long-term forecast, <laughs> which which keeps life more exciting. Yeah. One final question. I have a history of asking uh, more than one final question, but that will end on this. Um, you know, we talked about the supply chain shortages. Is also uh -huh. in most industries are also facing labor shortages. Uh, that uh -huh. seems to be a big problem. One thing I'm I've always been impressed, and this is not a show about STI Electronics. You know, rah rah go buy from them. That's not the point of this. My audience knows we don't go down those roads. But I do want to I do want to provide a compliment specific to your company. And the perception I see from your social media posts and, and and all that is you celebrate your team. You celebrate your employees. And I see um you know picnics and things like that. I I see anniversaries. You've got what appears to be a very loyal and low turnover uh, family of, of uh, team members that work with you. Um, am I characterizing that correctly? Is that just a perception? Is that perception correct? And, yeah. and how do you do that in today's world of you know, the stereotypical millennial who, who thinks that a long-term commitment is 10 minutes um, and doesn't really want to own anything so they can afford to just walk away from something when they get right. bored? Um, how, how have you, how have you held on to that traditional value of employer employee, uh, in, in, in such a successful way? Well, I, I, I appreciate you mentioning that. And, um, we, we are very fortunate in that. I think our, our average right now for our employees is they've been here a little over 10 years. Um, you know, there's good and bad to that. I mean, yeah, right. Yes, of course. Yeah. I've heard you talk about the gray tsunami, and I, I don't want to have it here. Yeah. But, um, but um, it, you know, we started out as a, literally as a family company. Um, you know, myself, my father, and my mother were there from day one. 
And um, so everybody we hired, we just kind of adopted into the family. Um, you know, it's my wife works a few hours here and there. So she's she's here some. I think everybody does know her, but um, she's around some. But otherwise, we're really not family anymore. But we still try to act like it. Um, so we try to pe treat people fairly. Um, we try, you know, we have to be competitive in our pay. Um, that's been tough in the last few years as, um, and it's tough right now as we watch, you know, inflation and all the other things going on. Um, but mainly we just try to treat people right. And, um, you know, they, we try to hire good people and, um, you know, I think I've become better over the years at hiring good people and staying out of their way. Um, I haven't always done a good job of staying out of their way and, uh, but, um, I think I've gotten better at it. Um, we've, we do lose some people sometime. I've got somebody tomorrow that just tomorrow is their last day. Um, and, and I hate to lose them. They've, been, they've only been here about two years. Um, but they're a valuable part of the team and we're out looking for a replacement, which is not so easy these days. Um, especially when you're trying to be picky on who you get. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I hate to lose them, but I understand. And, um, you know, I, I, I wish them the best. A lot of times we've had people leave and then come back. And, yeah. I've um, experienced that too. It's a, yeah, it's a sweet I, feeling. I, and it's funny because right. it's not a, I told you so moment. It's a, no. a gratitude moment. It's it, they, they need to, you know, the Amish. So I understand the Amish, uh, kids that grow up when they become 18 or whatever age, they are allowed to leave the community and go off for a year. And they have a name for that, but their their role their the purpose of that is to make sure they really want to come back and be part of that unique okay. lifestyle and go see the world, go see everything you're missing, go crazy. It's kind of the way uh -huh. you know other communities yeah. send their kids to college. You know they have that crazy experience, um, and then those that want to come back and they appreciate the lifestyle that they grew up mm -hmm. in, they appreciate it more. And I guess the same can be said for people who leave jobs in pursuit uh -huh. of greener pastures and then they realize that it's astroturf it's not really green <laughs> and and they come back to a more um on their own timing and then they probably stay for life they're probably life at that point right and, and they're also um evangelists to with talking with other people about right. you know it's really not so great out there <laughs> right right that's true well uh david uh, raby thank you again for being my guest um and uh, again for my audience uh if you would like to reach out to uh, David. Uh, I'll put his contact information as well as his company's website on our show notes. I told you earlier how to look down uh, on the show notes and you can find that. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to see the uh, Concept to Creation podcast all about um, David's uh, mom and dad and David's journey in creating this 40-year-old uh, successful company, um, it's a very interesting story. Uh, and David was extremely candid and uh, talked about the hard days and, and uh, the easier days. I'd never say easy, I'd say easier days. Uh, and it, that's a great, uh, it's a great insight into what goes on to build a business, particularly in a family environment. So I'll put a link to that episode as well. So David, um, I uh, wish you continued success. I don't think you need luck. You've got a lot of that already. And um, thanks again for being my guest on the Reliability, if I could even say it now, the Reliability Matters podcast. I appreciate you okay. being here. Well, Mike, thanks for having me. Thanks for doing these. I listened to all of them and really enjoy it. I think you're doing a service to our industry by doing these. So, so well, thank you. Well, thank you. As are you doing a service. I'm just the, I'm just the, uh, the, the guy asking the questions. I appreciate your expertise. And, you know, the purpose of the show is to create an archive of knowledge. And, uh, as we talked about the silver tsunami, you know, people leaving the industry, my hope with uh, the show is that maybe younger people that come into this industry that um, know how electrons work because they've just been educated but don't really know how our industry works uh, can, can gather um, knowledge from people like yourself who've been around a while and, and are very good at what they do. So thank you for um, your continued um, support of the show and, and me and, and everything else you do in the training and in the IPC world and SMTA world, our trade associations. I appreciate everything you do there. So, um, and I'll, um, now for those of you who are 
watching this or listening to this, um, we already had our 100th episode. You're you're the first. You're our next step toward 200. Now you're our first guest toward 200. Um, but um, uh, David, I'll I'll look forward to seeing you next week uh, during the 100th live episode. Okay. And for those of you who said, what is he talking about? I'll put a link to a recorded version of our 100th live episode. Um, hopefully, hopefully it happened and hopefully it went off uh, problem free. If not, uh, we'll show you a problem free version. One of the, We'll make it happen. Thanks, David. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on our newest channel, Amazon Music, or your favorite podcast app. We're everywhere. A special thanks to Circuit Assembly Magazine's PCB Chat at PCBChat.com and Ascendo Reliability for syndicating the show. Ascendo Reliability is at reliability.fm. Thanks for all of your questions and episode suggestions. Please keep them coming. Send comments and episode suggestions to my email address, mike at mikeconrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. And be sure and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and click the subscribe button and bell icon to be notified when new episodes are released. We do release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. Once again, thanks for listening or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and perhaps most importantly, keep doing it right. I'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters. Reliability Matters.